Hello everyone, this is Chris Yoke of Yoke Pin Company. Um, I'm going to uh, be kind of giving you a, a tour of the making of the Vitolo Oblique Pin Holder. Um, it starts um, at, with a piece of uh, highly figured and flame maple. And um, I turn it on my lathe here at my shop. And right now what I'm doing is just making this blank round. Um, it starts out as a square piece of stock and I make it round and I'll do this down to the size that it will end up being which is in largest size and diameter is a half inch um, which is roughly 13 millimeters in diameter um, and that's the very first thing I do. Here I'm getting set up to take the measurements of the wood. Um, doing a little bit more trimming. There we go. A little bit more. And then the, I will be making the end of the blank round as well, all the way down so I don't waste many, much wood. And now I create. Um, basically the end, the foot of the pin, um, created a space there that that will be the definitive foot of the pin. And I take a, uh, what's called a story stick now, which is marking some um, important measurements on it, makes it quicker for me. So each one of those little lines reflects a uh, part that I will be turning. Um, that first one right there that I just took off is the skinniest part. That's the part where your fingers rest. Um, and it goes down to 3 8 of an inch, which is roughly like 10, 11 millimeter. Um, closer to 10, I believe. And this is the beginning of the hourglass shape um, that it's known for. And then after that section I will start tapering down the back portion of the body of the pen which the body is that um, pencil mark that's right there to the left of my chisel um, that's the main body as you can see now there's some shape to it um, and then the next line to the right that next pencil line is going to um, be the portion where there's a swell in the tail um, and that swell in the tail um, is something that was kind of um, taken from a Kelschner pin holder. Kelschner had a pin holder that um, had a little one single swell in the tail like that and it was something I did a long time ago and Joe liked it, Joe Fitolo, who designed this pin basically. He selected the parts that he wanted and the sizes and the materials etc. Um, and he liked that shape so that's what we went where what he selected sorry not what we went with because he he's the one like I said designed this I'm just kind of doing the work um, so now I'm starting to uh, sh shape the main portion of the pin you're gonna see you know the overall shape of it starting to form um, this is just a rough shape and I should start here in just a second this is the finial right I start shaping the finial a little bit and giving a definitive end to the pin so I know how to work in between that, you know, those two dimensions. Um, that's the beginning of the finial. And then the next thing I will do is take this tail down to a uh, thinner um, diameter and straight up to the finial. And then I'll work through this and we'll uh, just clean up, you know, all the the measurements and everything and clean up the form and make it um, much more refined refining the shape more and more Now you can see that uh, I've got the pretty much the overall shape and I'm going to start doing the final um, shaping of all the 
pieces and parts before sanding. Um, so I'm making sure that you know dimensions are in line with the way that this pin is supposed to look. Um, that it will also balance correctly in the hands. Um, and I'm now move on to sanding. Um, I, I work through sanding in four grits for sanding the first being 120 grit sandpaper, which basically just takes all of the uh, the big grooves and notches and tear out and things like that, which I uh, I don't I try to eliminate as much as possible, but it still happens. Um, you can see here I wasn't really happy with how thin that is; it didn't look right to me. So I'm going back in and uh, touching it up, thinning down that little uh, tail section a little bit more. Um, I will take and sand and run through several grits. Like I said, um, 120, 220, 300, and then 400 grit sandpaper is the final. Um, once I get through 400, I will take the, uh, on the right, you see that little waste block. Um, I will take that and cut it off the pin. Um, so I, this is all in preparation for dyeing and finish work. See, I dropped the sandpaper a lot. <laughs> and we're moving on to another grid. We're at 220. And 220 is in, in the making of any pin holder. 220 is the most important grid because that removes all of the things that you will see visually with your eye. Um, that takes all the scratches out. You will see um, anything beyond 220 you don't see so much with your eye unless you're looking really really close and in detail um, it's more feel beyond that so 220 is a very very important step in the sanding of any wooden object once the 220 done which is I'm moving to the 300 now it'll go quite a bit quicker Okay, and I've finished off the sanding and now what I'm going to do is I'm going to remove that little waste block like I said um, I'll give some final last minute shape to that finial and then I'll have to shape it to uh, sand it so we've got now the uh, piece of wood is released it's held in only by the chuck on the left and so now I start over with 120 quickly it goes pretty quick the finial because it's so small and I start over and um, sand out that finial to its final shape and dimension. Okay, so now I'm pretty happy with the way it's turned out. I've got it all sanded. Um, i trying to put my hand there so you can see it a little bit better. I think I grab a, yeah, I grab that so you can see the pin a little bit better to hide that black area. Um, so the next step is going to be applying the dye. Um, the dye I apply is an alcohol-based dye. Um, and this particular color was uh, a color that Joe said he wanted it red. Um, and so I tried to go with, he has a uh, ink that he really, really likes. Um, I'm trying to remember the name of, I believe it's Yama Buddha is the name of the ink. Um, it's by Pilot, I, I can't recall. But anyway, I tried to get that little, that, that color. So it's a two stage dye. So the first thing I do is apply some red um, in a certain color that I have. Um, and this will be the only time you will ever see me use gloves around a lathe. It's not a smart thing to use gloves because you can very easily catch gloves on a lathe. So first I apply the red and then I'm going to add a little bit of black to that shade of red that I have. 
and the next thing I do is what I call a wash and the wash takes off excess um, and it leaves those uh, the graining of the flame maple to uh, sh show a little bit better um, and what makes that grain that's like I said this is maple but it's specifically called flame or curly maple there's lots of names for it tiger maple um, but it's basically grain that's interlocked and going in two different directions together so what you're seeing there is the reflection of the light off of the wood um, from two different places um, from two different angles sorry um, and now through the magic of video I've let it dry for about a half hour and soak in um, and I'm going to start applying the finish and um, the first thing I do is apply one coat of thin CA glue um, which CA glue is basically super glue but this is mercury glue that I use it's much more refined much more clear um, it's built it's made specifically for this application of applying a finish um, and I will build those up in steps and the reason I use CA glue is because of the fact uh, you will see it every once in a while and I think I, here in a few I, I pull out the uh, activator bottle spray bottle to show you I'm able to activate each coat so if I was applying a traditional like lacquer finish or what have you I would have to apply a coat let it set overnight apply another coat let it set overnight and repeat myself with that bottle right there that you see that's the accelerator um, with that I'm able to apply a coat activate it and harden it instantly and then apply another coat so it's the pretty much the saving way that I'm able to get pins done in any type of expedient manner um, I'm a one-man shop do this all myself I don't have you know a finish team doing finishing pins for me I do everything from start to finish so this allows me to do it much faster um, and in this section I'm just applying more and more coats to fill in all the grains I want to fill in all the voids um, and then what I'll do after all of the voids and there's just a solid sheet basically um, layer of glue is I will wet sand it down um, and that's the case with any finish on anything that's all you're doing you're building up a finish and then to get the gloss and the shine you sand it back down completely smooth because it's nearly impossible to apply a completely smooth finish um, there's a lot of work in the preparation of the finish afterwards so then I stopped to look at it that's what I was doing right there deciding if I needed more and I did evidently um, I always do a couple extra just to safeguard so I don't sand through I'm going to do my wet sanding and that should be coming up in the near future and this is kind of a boring part of the pen it's just repetitive um, over and over and so will be the wet sanding so bear with us it'll be over shortly And now I've started wet sanding so um, what I'm doing here is I'm taking sandpaper and dipping it in water and the uh, water helps reduce the amount of heat generated by the friction of the sandpaper so you create a smooth surface um, and you do this over and over through several grits um, I start off with four or six hundred grit um, I say four or six hundred because six hundred is safer to do. I do four hundred because it's a little bit quicker, but you got to be very, very careful. And then I start working through. These are called uh, micro mesh sanding pads. Um, they're made for high finish work. Um, this first grit is um, fifteen hundred, and these go all the way up to twelve thousand grit. Um, to give you an idea of how far that is, typically like. 
if you're a homeowner and you go out to the store and buy a, a, a pack of sandpaper, you'll have coarse, medium, and fine. And usually those grits are coarse as 80 grit. Um, fine is like 120 or medium is like 120 and fine is like two or 300 typically. Um, that's the, the, the grit and we're going to 12,000 here. So that's what gives it that mirror like finish. Um, it feels like glass when it's done. Um, and actually there's another step after this. And what you see I'm doing here is I'm moving left to right instead of constantly in that circle around it. So with the, the black grit, which is I believe around 3000 or so grit, um, I do that side to side motion and that helps make sure that there's no um, lines going you know, uh, in a circle around the pen, sorry. So now I just finish these out and I go all the way to the pink pad, which is 12,000. giving it the last bit of the wet sanding process. And I will uh, stop it here in a minute. I'm drying it off right now so I don't, the water can hide blemishes. So you dry it off and you finish and then look at it. And if you look at that line, that white reflection of the light through the pen, I'm looking at it, trying to find any uh, obvious little bubbles or errors in it. Um, so now the uh, pen is wet sanded. Um, and I will cut it off the lathe um, using a parting tool. So what I'll do is I'll part it off so that it's no longer attached to that waste block that's mounted in the chuck there on the left. And there is the finished with this step part of the pin, which is the turning of it and the finishing of dying and the finishing of it. Next thing I do is you see there's that little itty bitty piece on the end. I always shave those off with a chisel to make it flat. Um, give me a starting flat surface. And I'm about, I'm looking at the piece and deciding which side of the grain is visually the best because I want that to face up on the pin so that when it's, you're riding with it or it's laying on the table, you see that best part of the grain. And now I'm cutting the slot for the flange because this will be an oblique pin holder with a uh, brass flange. And so I'm cutting the slot and I do this freehand. I've done it so many times that uh, I can just do it freehand and quickly. And as requested and as I do on most of my beginner pins, you can see that slot is a little bit of an angle up an upward cant, um, which gives it a better experience it's easier out of the box basically to write with um, the nibs not as so prone to catch on the paper so now I'm at the my buffing station which is set up on a additional lathe in my shop um, that's brown tripoli um, buffing compound and I'm just buffing out that finish even a little bit more um, especially after cutting it, there's a little bit of a rough edge from that saw, even though it's a very fine Japanese saw, it leaves a little bit of a rough edge that helps knock that off of there. And after that, I move to the white diamond compound, which is um, very, very fine polishing compound and takes out any scratches you may see. It'll be a, you'll see it's complete, it's about twice as shiny as it was compared to when we started. I should hold it up here in the light in just a moment. And there you can see that it's quite shiny. All right, now we're going to move into, that was in the main part of my shop. I'm now in my finishing room, um, which is basically a separated little office area where I do all the finish work to my pens. All this little stuff is kept there, the laser and things like that for engraving the flange. 
I'm starting the process of creating the flange itself. This is a Bullock flange, so there's two parts up to it. Um, the first one that I did a while ago was the top part of the flange, which holds a standard dip. And what I'm forming now is the crow quill section of that flange, um, which will go underneath. Um, and it allows the pen to use standard nibs and crow quill nibs. And the fact that we'll, you'll see that I'll be adding the hardware that you see in there um, to it, it'll make it very easy. You can see that red light that's showing um, I'm engraving right now and um, should have dusted off my laser evidently before I started this. Um, I'm engraving uh, the serial number on the back and also the yoke pen logo. Uh, you'll see here in a moment, I'll pull it out. Um, and it says, Yoke Pen Company, Vitolo number 28. So this is pin number 28, the 28th I've made. Um, and now I'm engraving the text on the flange, which is um, a text requested by Joe. That's a very important theme and overall thing, you know, uh, just a, a way of life pretty much for him, which is pay it forward. Um, he started out and got a lot of help from people when he first started learning um, in Grocer Script. And since then he's done uh, countless things for the penmanship community. Um, and so this is his little motto that he always says, which is pay it forward. And you'll see it, it's done in a uh, grocer's type script. I, I, I forget what the font's called, but it's it, it's in, Groper, in grocer ish with a little bit of Spencerian mixed in there, whatever. Okay, so I now have the two parts of the flange. They are engraved, they're ready to start forming. So I'm using uh, the pliers that I've developed to form the uh, flange, which makes it really, really fast, really, really easy to do, um, not only to make a flange, but adjust a flange. So that's the top half, and you'll see it lays on top of that lower croquel section. Now what I have to do is I have to trim it to fit the angle. Um, and I'm usually, if I recall, I think this is pretty right on when I do it. It's pretty darn close. I may have to trim it again. I forget. Um, and I will. I can see already. Um, i trying to recall when I <laughs> recorded this because I'm doing the voiceover afterwards. So the, uh, the what I got to do make sure here is that nibs can align so that nib point aligns with the, the uh, longitudinal center axis of the pen holder. So I'm using a couple different nibs of different lengths and I verify before I, you know, uh, say that's going to fit. Right now I'm scribing a line so I'll know when to trim it. And that's where to trim it. Um, and that's for the Bullock flange portion of it. A um, little bit different than your standard flange. So I'm trimming the second part, the crow quill section, to be the same length as the other. And I'm going to insert it and I'm going to scribe a line on the back of it where it will be trimmed because there will be only one brass surface of each section of the flange that's actually attached to the pin. The two other sections will be loose and be able to open and close so that you can insert nibs. And now I am um, mark, center punching a mark where I will drill a hole for the bolt that goes through it. The small little bolt requires a uh, flathead screwdriver to open and close and insert nibs makes it convenient especially for those learning and just trying to decide what nibs they like um, it's very very helpful and that's what this this whole pen is intended as a as a beginner pen but an upgraded version so we want it the whole thing that Joe and I both want out of you know all of the functions of this pen is that someone new can spend a little bit of money. Um, I, I've reduced the price for what I would typically charge as, a, as a, just kind of a favor to the project, but uh, it allows them to have a nice high quality pen out of high quality materials without breaking the bank. So I am now getting ready to start trimming and fitting the flange to the pen. Um, I will trim off that excess. That's why I scribed that line. Um, and that will allow that top layer of that section of the flange to be not attached directly to the staff of the pin holder itself. It opens upon itself 
as the brass part. And I do that to both sides. Okay, so now I've got my little uh, handheld tool, rotary tool, um, and I'm going to take those edges because right now, because they were cut off at an angle, they're sharp. They can poke your fingers, your fingers and your thumbs are right against this flange all the time. So I take a little bit extra time and uh, smooth those out and make sure they're really nice, smooth looking and also won't poke you in the finger. Half that crow quill side. I'm doing the same thing again just to make it look nicer, be a finished product and again not injure you. Okay, so now I'm going to double check the fit, make sure that all the trimmings are correct. Um, if I need to leave a little, I, when I install these, there needs to be a little bit of space in between that cut that I made and the pin staff itself. So I double check these before I um, permanently put this flange together and on the pin. Um, what I'm doing now is grabbing the bolt and the nut and I'm assembling the flange. Um, the nut on the back side will be soldered permanently. Um, that allows you to not have to have a secondary tool and make it very, very simple for you to just turn a screw. Um, otherwise, that nut on the back would turn. Um, so I go through the extra effort to attach it via solder. extra helping hands to help me hold this thing while I solder it. And something that you'll notice here in a moment, when you solder, this is something that not everybody knows. Usually people solder and they, they, they stick the soldering iron on something and they apply the solder right where the the solder tip is and that's not the way you want it the solder will always right there I'm just warming it up making it force the more we see it on the, on the opposite side of where the solder gun is um, and what happens with solder is solder will always flow towards the heat surface sur the surface of heat so wherever the heat source and surface is it will flow in that direction so you go from the opposite side and it will automatically flow around that nut and be nice and pretty and not a big clob. That also helps eliminate a cold solder joint, which is basically a joint where the solder is only attached to one surface. All right, so now I'm going to get, uh, it's hot, so I'm holding with pliers. Um, I'm gonna get my rotary tool again, and uh, I will file off the edges to make sure they're nice and smooth, and it looks good, and it's all level and even and will look pretty. Uh, begin attaching the flange to the pin holder staff. So I do one final last check to look and make sure all the surfaces and the gaps are as they need to be, the geometry's right and everything before I permanently attach it. Um, and the way I prefer to attach is via a couple of brass pins. Um, actually, one brass pin typically in most pin holders. However, if the foot will end up being angled, which will be one of the last steps you see in this pin, um, I actually put two in there because there's not a, the, the long and short is there's not a way for glue to hold it in two direct the flange in two directions. So this helps be a mechanical bond and secure that flange so it should never come loose because you know that, that flange needs to be attached permanently to the pin and not move or else it can mess up your letter. So on the uh, angled feet I always put two pins. These are just little brass rods that I put in the back. And all this stuff, all these pieces and parts you can buy on my website too.
Okay, so I've pushed them down below the surface and um, the reason I do that is I don't want a bunch of glue in the bottom of the pin. If I ever need to take that pin off out for some reason, I want to be able to do it easily. So I take a medium viscosity CA glue and I put a little tiny, you'll see here, I'm under magnification, I put a dot on each one of those. So if I ever need to get those pins out, all I do is drill out that little bit of glue on top and usually I can take that pin and smack it on this hard surface, um, a protected hard surface, and um, it will come, those pins will fall out. So now I'm filling in, there's a little gap right there that I always fill in and um, I, it, it's ray, I try to smooth it out as much as possible. There's always a little bit of rays. So here in a second, after I activate it, um, you should see the spray. Um, I will, as you see, I'm taking, these are the same micro mesh pads that I wet sanded with only in a little stick form. And I'm smoothing out all those little bubbles to make them nice. Um, and what I'll actually do is go back to the lathe and buff them out so they match in glossiness to the rest of the pen. You can see that there's a lot of little detail work that goes into these, um, every pin I make. Um, and this one being a lot of extra details because of the engraving, the pull-up flange, the angled foot. There's a lot of extra steps in this that you wouldn't have with, you know, say one of my budget pin holders. done very soon okay so there it is it's still shiny it just knocked off those little glue bumps now what I'm doing now is angling the foot of the pen so basically you'll see that I'm going to sand off at the same angle that the flange is mounted um, and the purpose of this was something that um, Joe kind of brought to reality more so than anything else. I've seen like one old pin with it, but not that's a rarity. Um, it allows you to the pin in ink without sticking the wooden part of the pin in ink constantly because you are as an oblique put it in, in there in an angle and that part that I sanded off um, would be the first thing that would want to go into the ink as far as the pin staff. So that sands it off and gives it a certain look and but it's primarily a function more so than anything else. Um, and now, one of the last steps I do in all my pins is I brand my name on it. Um, this derived from the Magnuson pin holder in the uh, late 1800s. They stamped their name, uh, Oscar Magnuson stamped his name into the end of every pin. So I did it as a nod to the past. And so what I'm doing now is grabbing uh, the same die that I used to dye the pin putting a little bit on a q-tip and um, I'm going to be dyeing the end of that pin to match now that it's the exposed surface of the wood that you will see and just dyeing the wood red and then the uh, the last step coming up, and I'll kind of wrap this up as I'm explaining this, is I put another coat of CA glue on the end of this pin to keep the water from wicking up into the wood. Um, so I'm sealing the end of the pin for moisture, for moisture because we are dipping in, you know, these pins in ink, water-based inks and water, which water and wood is not a good mix. So I'm sealing it up. So, well, um, here in a moment, this is going to end. Um, you'll see the finished pin. And I hope you enjoyed this um, kind of behind the scenes look at every little detailed step process I go through in making a pin and especially seeing the uh, end result of the Vitolo pin. Um, pretty special thing. So thanks again.